Ian Pace from Deep Purple, my pleasure to welcome you to Noise11.com. And might I say, and I'm uh, mighty looking forward to seeing the band back in Australia soon. Uh, it's nice to be able to be go back there one more time because uh, there's certain territories you think, well, maybe this is the last time I'll have the fun of being here. It's just nice to know we've got at least one more shot. <laughs> well, last time I did a deep uh, purple interview would have been a couple of years ago. It would have been Roger and it was the Whoosh album, yeah. at which point yeah. uh, he was suggesting at that point that Whoosh was going to be the last ever deep purple album. Um, you mm -hmm. went back and then did uh, another album after that. Were you surprised that you had one more even after Whoosh in you? I'm not really surprised, no. Um, I think reality does punch you in the face and you sort of realise that the... Uh, the possibility of touring, uh, that that time becomes shorter and shorter. But going into the studio and as long as you've got the ideas, going in the studio and knocking out a record, it's not difficult. The ideas are the difficult thing. Playing it, recording it, that's not too bad. It's not physical. You know, you, you play for five minutes, you go and listen to it, you have a coffee. It's not like being on stage for a couple of hours which is a little more demanding when you're not in your early 20s. <laughs> <laughs> Doing an album of covers, though, uh, you know, it kind of felt to me like a bit of bookends because, you know, when we go to early Purple and songs like Hush, which was a cover, yeah. Kentucky Woman, which was a cover. Uh, yeah. So it's interesting that you started off you know, doing other people's songs <laughs> and then suddenly here we are in the 21st century with another Deep Purple covers album. Well, the, the point is when we started out, back in 68, we weren't really blessed with songwriters. We could put a couple of tunes together, yeah, but it was always a struggle. So using uh, somebody else's genius to um, put try and put our stamp on somebody else's work, that was one of the only options we had. It's only when Ian and Roger joined the band that uh, we also gained two songwriters. So it became possible then to create our own stuff. But during the pandemic, when we did the uh, Turning to Crime record, and the, the, it's a tongue-in-cheek title, because you know, everybody said, this is a, what are they doing? This is criminal. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we are all locked, at, locked in our houses, couldn't get together. We couldn't get together and write new music. It was impossible. So we thought, rather than sit there for two years doing nothing, let's just pick some songs and some artists we really like and pay a little homage to them. Uh, and again, it, you know, it worked out really well, considering that me and Paul were thousands of miles apart when we did it. Um, the, the, the genius of modern technology, also the downfall <laughs> of music. Um, but, you know, it was, it was worthwhile doing something. We had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, but it. But it was for that occasion where you just couldn't do anything else. And it's better to do something than nothing. But, but I guess like those early the, days, it was unique, wasn't it? Because, you know, when you put that deep purple stamp on uh, those uh, cover songs on the Crime album, uh, yeah. again, it reminds me of, uh, you know, Hush sounded nothing like uh, Joe South. <laughs> Kentucky Woman no. doesn't sound like a Neil Diamond song. No, no. But, you know, when we did the, the Crime record, uh, a couple of things are very, very close because once something's been done and done really well, um in a similar genre, it's very, very hard to change it and make it better. The, the guy who wrote it and did it, he got pretty much to 100% of what there was in the song. So you've got to pay a, a little respect to that. But when you're taking something like like Hush, which was like a country tune, and you turn it into a samba, a rock and roll samba, then you've got a little more leeway to, to have fun with it, you know. Mm. A song like Black Knight, a number one hit in Australia. Imagine a song like that being number one on a chart today. <laughs> but, yeah, no. But, no, you can't. You got well, you, you, you don't get a look in anymore. Um, the media now are fixated on singers. Nothing wrong with that. There's some great singers around. And pop bands. That's it. Rap. Whatever you want to call it. Uh, Bebop. Uh, that's all they're interested in because that's what the last... Uh, demographic told them that they would get the advertising from. So rock and roll now is, is a very, very uh, poor relation. Hmm. Not musically, but uh, 
for for the uh, the commercial interests of radio and TV. Now they, they they never knew what to do with it anyway, and they've got even less clue now. Yeah, you must be very proud of that uh, first four or five seconds of, De- of Black Knight, though. I mean, it's instantly recognisable, isn't it? As soon as that first drum bit <laughs> hits, you know what well, you're in for. Well, it's amazing what you do when you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> what? You're, did, you're, we, you there, know, was there any thought into that? No, just we we'd been in the studio all day long, being told we had to make a single, and we had nothing. We had nothing written. We just what do you mean we've got to go and you know we had a day off between gigs the managers chuck us in the studio and after i don't know seven hours or something we had absolutely nothing so we went down to the pub and we got chucked out of the pub at closing time and then in a sort of bleary sort of alcohol induced haze we just came up with bits we stuck them together and people liked it even though it really makes no sense at all and people still like it to this day. There is no logic to it. It's like you hasn't listen to the Stones thing, you know, Charlie comes in with that cow, da dum, da dum, dum. You know it straight away. It's sometimes it's the simple things which lock into the public's psyche. And if you could write a hundred of them in a day, you'd be as rich as Elon Musk, I tell you. <laughs> but they're the hardest things to come across. You have done a few, though. What about the intro to Fireball? Like, I listen to Fireball and I'm exhausted after three minutes. What about <laughs> you? Well, when you've got a riff which needs a rhythmic backup, you find the only solution that really works. And for me, it was doing something that I'm, I re- I'm not known for, I'm not very good at, which is the double bass drum thing. But I could... I could do that. And to be honest, 50 years later, that's all I can do with two bass drums. My brain doesn't work that way. I've just, I'm just done a, a reaction video to a, a really great young drummer who's double bass drum thing. And what they're doing with it, I mean, it's no problem because I don't want to do it, but I appreciate how hard it is, what it is they do now and how it's sort of moved on. And it must, you know, music and drums especially must, must evolve, must go somewhere else. But, uh, you know, I don't have to be involved with it because it's not not my thing. Hmm. But Fireball was, uh, it worked out really, really well. And it gave me a lot of fun in the breaks to show off a little bit. Uh, that sort of track for me today would be totally impossible. Not because I can't do it, but the, the changes in recording techniques mean now we're in that digital age where things have to be chopped up into pretty little patterns. Hmm. And the freedom to do those fills... You can't do it with metronomic time. You just can't do it. There has to be some, an ebb and flow, a wave inside it. And if you don't have that freedom, it's almost impossible to do those crazy films. You know? One of the um, uh, signature parts of a Deep Purple concert, I don't think it's in there anymore, um, your instrumental piece in The Mule. When was the last time that was done live by the band? Oh, a few years back. And it's not because I can't do it. I just sort of lose interest. Um it's like anything. Once you've played something too many times, you start trying to, I mean, not even trying, you start recreating what you did somewhere in the, in the past. And it just gets a little dull. I mean, I would rather with Purple, where you have a limited time on stage, I'd rather stick another song in than to have three or four minutes of me flashing around the kit. I do little ex- external Deep Purple gigs where I'm working with other people. And uh, I would always do something. I mean, it might only be a couple of minutes long. It might be five minutes long. When I go and have a look at uh, Deep Purple in Rock, followed by Fireball, followed by Machine Head, followed by Who Do We Think We Are? Uh, that yeah. was June 1972, January 1973. Those four albums mm-hmm. came out in a two and a half year period. Uh, yeah. How, how grueling was that for you to get all that done in that time and tour at the same time? <laughs> As I said earlier, if you've got the ideas, making a record really isn't too much of a problem. It's having the time to, to put the ideas together. And quite often we would create something in the studio and record it an hour later um, and hope that Ian and Roger could actually find a top line and, and a lyric that would work with it. Um, so that wasn't difficult. <clears throat> and I remember back in 73, we were the, the biggest album sellers in the US because we had so many records coming out. Um, I don't think we think it was 
hard work at the time. You know, when you're kids, every day is a gig day. Every every day you're playing your music is a great day. Uh, a little later when life gets, a, shall we say, more confusing, more stuff in your head to worry about, that's not really possible. So it's not unusual when bands are uh, in the eye of the public and it's all you do. It's all you do in your life. You get up, where am I going today? Where am I playing? And you just continue. So it, it, it didn't seem a big deal anyway. Well, you know, there were four uh, absolutely amazing albums back to back. <clears throat> and then there was the trio after that of uh, Burns, Stormbringer, Come Taste the Band, a completely <coughs> different sounding Deep Purple. Yeah. Uh, you're the common denominator in in every album. We should point out. Yeah. Um. Did Did it feel like a different band, or has it always felt like Deep Purple to you? I think the souls pretty much remain the same. Trying to be as creative as you can within a somewhat limited style of music. Um. Uh, but of course, when you've got five people in a band and you change forty percent of the band, uh, when Ian and Roger left and. David and Glenn came in, of course it's going to change the whole dynamic. And you have to adjust what you play to fit in with these new people. And with Glenn, it was not so much uh, a massive difference, but he was far busier with the notes than Roger is. So that meant there's less room for me to do stuff. But that's a bad thing. It's just, you know, it's always a balance. You've only got 100% of anything. Mm. All these people say, I give it 110%. Nonsense. (laughs) <laughs> Once you got to the top, you got to the top. <clears throat> so I would adjust some of the things I played because of Glenn's bass playing, bass playing, which is great. Uh, but it, you know that's that's a musical decision that this this is the best thing to do. If he's playing all those notes and I'm playing hundreds of notes, it's just a mess. So there was a, a little bit of compromise. Sometimes he'd back off a bit and I could do something, and sometimes I'd back off a bit and he could do something. Um, with Roger, it's a far more straightforward process. He, he is a wonderful foundation bass player. He sets the thing for me to sit on, mm. you know, and it gives me all that freedom to do those things. It was the uh, Perfect Strangers album. The classic lineup, uh, I guess, comes back together again. Mm. Uh, and the title track from that album has become a staple point of the set list. Yeah, well, <clears throat> when you find a, a tune that uh, you think is musically valid, and you find that the people like it too, because they the, the two don't always go together. You know, sometimes you think this is a great track and you love it for the rest of your life, but you just couldn't give a toss. It means nothing to them. When you find one that ticks both those boxes that you think is good yourself musically and the audience like it, well, you're on a winner, aren't you? You know, you've always got another song to play in the in the concert venue, which you know is gonna go down great. And then that was followed up with House of Blue Light. Again, you know, the same lineup. You know, I think I th- I, th- I think of, you know, that lineup as being the classic lineup because, you know, I guess they were the yeah, yeah, of course. biggest yeah. albums over the years. But, you know, that one had a lot of turbulence in it, didn't it? It sort of, yeah, well, uh, you could see the a, cracks it a, forming. It was a tough record to make. Um, we thought we'd found a, a good venue to, to record in. It sort of sounded okay when we checked it out for its acoustic sound. When we got the stuff in there, it just sounded awful. And so there was no great will to go in every day and start recording. It, was, it became definitely a labour of work but rather than a labour of love. And that really started our disenchantment with making records. You know, we really didn't enjoy going to the studio for a good 20 years. It was, uh, oh no, let's get back on the road. That's where we have fun. It really only regenerated itself when we brought uh, Bob Ezrin into the uh, into the corral with the Now What record. He made recording fun again. He did it quickly. He got a great sound. He contributed ideas, musical ideas, which if we were going up a blind alley, he would say, well, don't do that. Do this. Hmm. Something out, outside of our five minds. So recording became fun again. Hence, we've get in the studio when we can every two, three years and knock out another record. And we have fun with Bob. He's a taskmaster. Hmm. You know, he doesn't doesn't suffer fools or lazy people very, very well. And uh, sometimes that can get up your back a bit. 
but at the end at the end of the day the product is there you know so this is what we did and you find you did it in two or three weeks Hmm. which is instead of better than three or four months, you know, with the time which you, you've lost interest in the record, you hate it, it you know, it just takes too long. So, uh, you know, enjoying being on the road so much, um, you know, obviously is how classics like this have been created. Uh, do you enjoy the, the art of the live album? Yeah, but you have to understand that to get one of those, you probably end up with four or five which aren't usable, but you have to take the chance. And uh, even that is an amalgamation of two or three concerts, you know. Which, which ten years is a... ago became the box set, which yeah. I, I love because yeah, I can yeah. listen to those concerts. Yeah. Um, so you have to understand that most live records are A, not from one show, B, not live. <laughs> There's a lot of fixing goes on in the studio nowadays, and but there always was. But the fixing you could do back in the analog days was very minimal. Uh, the nature of live recording is each sound spreads into another sound. The only thing you can't mess around with on a live recording is the drums because everything feeds into the drums. So, you know, every live record I've made is 100% live. I don't touch my stuff, you know. I just hope we we got it good enough that I can live with it. Um, so I'm I'm sort of like this with live records. When I when I hear where they found another one and they bring it out, I generally don't listen to it. It is what it is, a bit of history. If people like it, great. But I don't break my heart over it or go, wow, wasn't I great? You know, it was for that moment in time for me. But for other people who, I mean, we get some wonderful obsessive fans and that they're, they're, they're the backbone of the fact that we're still here <clears throat> and they will have everything we've ever done. So if another... Uh, undiscovered live recording comes out, of course they're interested in it. You can make hundreds of live recordings. And you've got some of the artists today where half of it's pre-recorded anyway. <laughs> um, they're not taking much of a chance. You know, I see all these uh, <clears throat> stars of today dancing around the stage and singing. You can't do that. No. There's not enough air in your body to go yes. careering around the stage and perform beautifully with your voice. So, you, you know, it, it's all fake. Nothing wrong with it. It's show business. Don't really call it music. It's, it's a different thing. That's right. There was that famous video from last week when Madonna fell off a chair and dropped it's the still microphone going. and the vocal kept going. Yeah, of course, yeah. But, mm. you know, it's show business. <clears throat> and show business has always been about artifice and confusing you and misdirecting you. But so long as the end product's okay, but accept what it is. Don't, mm. don't equate it with something it's not. Mm. I was at a special Deep Purple show one night. Obviously, you do your your best to support uh, new and up and coming talent. Uh, it was Sydney, nineteen yeah. eighties, and you introduced uh, a young kid, uh, George from Liverpool in Sydney. George from Liverpool, yeah. <laughs> George, George Harrison George. with Deep Purple yeah. playing at the uh, <coughs> Sydney Entertainment Centre. That was a night. Yeah, well, he's a good pal of mine. George was. Um, we live where well, we lived less than three miles apart from each other. His house is still there and his son, Danny, popped around all the time. Uh, so, you know, we were neighbours. He just happened to be down there at the same time and dragged him up for a bit of fun at the end of the show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very memorable. <laughs> well, you've got um, Alice Cooper, Placebo, Psychedelic Furs, so many great bands, Blondie, uh, on, on this yeah. Uh, pandemonium tour coming up but you've also yeah. got an Australian band called Wolf Mother who um, were very much influenced by Deep Purple. Are you familiar with well, lots of, Wolf Mother? Yeah, well lots of bands were influenced by Purple and uh, Anne Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and Jeff Tull and you could name Anne Free I mean the, uh, the explosion of music that came out of the UK in that period of time it took over the world, you know, and so it's 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 not surprising that the, that heritage has moved on, even two or three generations later, because those, re those records are immortal, you know. Mm. Uh, people hear them again for the first time, and there's still a sort of wonderful human magic to them. They're not perfect, but they're perfect. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, so that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and we do shows like the ones coming up, coming up in Australia. We don't. We couldn't care less whether we headline or go second on the bill or whatever. The ego days have gone. We've had that one. Of them. We're, we're happy that we can go on stage 
and have a lot of fun and dare the next band to go on after us. <laughs> <laughs> and with Alice, it, Alice, there's two bands which are the hardest bands in the world to follow. Alice is one because it's pure, glorious theatre with yeah. some good musicians. And status quo is the other. Yeah. Because they get about 5,000 hits. Mm. <laughs> they sound pretty similar, but they just go hit, 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 hit. You know, and those two are, they're, they're a nightmare to follow. They really are. <laughs> so I don't mind if Alex goes on after it. That's fine and dandy. <laughs> yeah. Well, looking forward to it in Australia. Uh, and my pleasure to catch up with you again after 40 years. Yeah, we'll have to do it again another 40 then. Another 40? Yeah, then that makes us both. I'll tell you what, we'll compromise. We'll make it 20. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> pleasure, to, <laughs> pleasure to talk to you, Ian, and uh, looking forward to the Deep Purple show down Cheers, here. Cheers, man. Hope Bye -bye. to see you down there, yeah? Absolutely. Great stuff.